Okay, good afternoon everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Manuela, I work for the European Training Foundation and I am a person using a lot of disruption in meetings. So as the afternoon is quite uh, difficult to manage, especially as we are toward the end of our conference, I will first challenge you. And I will ask you to stand up and uh, just uh, come uh, closer to, to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come here. Just take a little walk around <laughs> and come closer to us. And while you move around, uh, I just uh, would like you to think, as it has been two days that we hear this word disruption, what really comes to your mind <laughs> when you hear disruption? What what do you think about? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Boren. That's a good feedback. <laughs> Anything else? Change. I'll, Change. I'll just start. You know, it's always hard to start. I know how it is. So how about this? Uh, for things to stay the same, many other things will need to change. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Movement. Very good. Innovation. How do you feel yourself when something disruptive happens? Opportunity. Opportunity. Some people don't like that much. They say, I stay seated, like Anastasia over there. She's like, okay, I don't want to work with her. <laughs> Why some people are eager to try out something else. Mm? So we all have different reactions to, this, to disruption. Uh, but in this session, we don't want to talk about disruption because we have heard a lot about that. We will talk about how we can actually exploit the skills potential that we have around us. And we have these two kids that try to reach out, uh, trying to fly. Uh, and there is a lot of potential around us, but potential means nothing if you don't do anything with it. So we heard in those days uh, uh, about many experiences and good practices and good ideas, a lot of potential, new skills coming up, uh, young people showing us a new way to do things. But if we don't act on it, nothing will happen. So sometimes uh, I hear people saying, we know what is the problem, we know we have already developed solutions, so why aren't we moving forward? Why aren't we taking off and using this potential? So in this session we will focus on this how. How do we make it happen? And how can we really exploit the potential that we have around us to manage the disruptions? This has been my major disruption. The, when I first uh, became a mother, I have now four children, so I perseverated. Uh, I don't know if uh, you have a kid, but usually it's a real, real challenge because as far as you really want to become a parent, nobody makes you ready for that, especially if you are a bit old. So what do you do? You look for experts. Mary Poppins, please help me. I don't know how to handle a child. You Google desperately about anything that happens to you, so you look for evidence around you. And of course, you rely on networks, on people. People close to you and people far from you that have similar experiences. This is what we also do in our work to manage skills. We have to rely on evidence. So we look for options and from different experiences, but then it's up to us to make a choice and act on it and use them. So today we will hear from our panelists what options are there. But then it will be up to us to do something with them and jump in the future. <laughs> and with this, we take another little walk, and while we start our session, <laughs> but if
if you feel sleepy during the session, you can stand up and walk around. We will not be disturbed about that. But I want to ask our um, dear panelists to do a little pitch and introduce themselves uh, by telling you why it's really worthwhile listening to them. What do they have to offer to us to know how to manage the skills potential in disrupted workplaces? So, Helen. Thank you very much, uh, Manuela. This is uh, disruptive, but in a very positive way. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be there with you this afternoon. Uh, so I'm Hélène Guillol. I'm working in Paris in UNESCO headquarters. I'm a program specialist and uh, in the section in charge of uh, technical and vocational education and training. And uh, as uh, Manuela mentioned, and as uh, we discussed a lot uh, during the, the, the last two days, uh, the, the disruptions can be positive and negative. Uh, and what uh, I would like to tell you today in the, in the, in the time that is uh, allocated to us is about how we can manage the potential of skills. The potential is uh, resources. So with resources, you have to manage that, meaning that uh, you have to choose and you have to choose uh, right according to different parameters. So this is what the UNESCO member states have to do because they are increasingly um, seen as responsible for uh, the, 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 the policy and the measures they are implementing uh, for, for the labor market, for uh, they are responsible for youth and employment. So they, they need for that uh, informed um, responses uh, to bring to the to the different um, the different audiences of their society, and I will talk a bit more uh, later about the initiative that uh, UNESCO has piloted in the the South Mediterranean region about how uh, we have tried and we have been trying to equip uh, the member states, the institutions, but also the young people with uh, some skills, some new skills, to better uh, see their future, to better interact with the different choices they have to make, uh, including policy making, but also individual uh, career choices. So we will talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Thank you. Davor. Thank you. Uh, bonjour. Uh, Always a pleasure to be here, actually, first time in Bonn, and uh, it's really lovely. I'm uh, Davor Mishklin from Burning Glass. Uh, we are a private organization uh, based in the United States, and um, um, the reason I'm here is to uh, tell you and talk to you about uh, how we can understand the skills from the employer perspective. Um, if you want to do it less technical, how to understand these voices of employers. and. Um, you know, we came to the methodology or to the system where we collect uh, job vacancies in large numbers and, uh, you know, what you call big data, and we process that in a certain way. And basically, at the moment, we could say this is the only demand-based data which can give you uh, s skill granularity in terms of uh, what market requires. And as you can see here, uh, um, uh, and one of my uh, main messages later will be to try to explain you what is the difference between data derived in this way in, and, and what was available so far, predominantly from the government. And probably as a conclusion, uh, and a little bit and partly on this slide, uh, I think the world economy, but I would say job seekers and students and population need a map, need a map of the labor market to be able to navigate. And listening to some of the discussions here around the VET, I'm thinking that could really resolve a lot of these issues we'll have. Because if I clearly see that uh, to get from A to B, uh, you know, what I need is, let's say, covered by the VET, I don't see logically why I would then go and study and, you know, just opt for the university where, uh, you know, it would not uh, be the shortest route uh, uh, by any means. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Caroline? 
Yes, let me, good afternoon to all of you. Let me follow uh, Manuela by saying that I also have four daughters, but fortunately for me, I did not have to look for a Mary Poppins because the father of my four daughters at that time took very good care of my children. And I think that's why my topic is very much part of my identity, but my work, I was recruited uh, to work in UNESCO 25 years ago, precisely as a women's education specialist. And of course, now the discourse has changed from women's programs to gender. And uh, the idea of this presentation is, in fact, to say that UNESCO has its priority, gender equality. And of course, now in SDG, we have this six, 17 goals, and supposedly, while there's a separate uh, gender uh, goal, there is also the need to integrate mainstream, operationalize. What does it really mean? No, and how do you really see gender as a transversal issue? And of course, when I wrote to Shamal, I said, do you know what? Look at all your disruptions. You talk about migration, climate change, and technology. But gender is a very key disruptive element that we rarely talk about. If you've seen, I was joking when we were preparing our panel, we are mo the most disruptive panel because for the first time in a TVET panel, you have mostly women. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, we should congratulate the organizers because if you've noticed for the past days, they really had women in the panel and that for a sector that is male dominated. And my idea for this afternoon in, is to share with you two years work now. Uh, we have a funding from the EU on STEP. It's called Skills Technical, Technology Education Program. And we are now in its, on the second year. And one key objective is promote equitable and gender balanced access to TVET. What does that exactly mean? So with the data that we have, I'll be showing you the shift of discourse from access to where. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And the next question is for you. So we will not wait until the end of the session to get your brains in motion. But I would like really to ask you when you think about data and uh, uh, the work that uh, our panelists will present to you that have different shapes. What are the questions that you have already? What would you like to know from them? And not to put you under embarrassment, I actually give you one minute so that you can talk to the person next to you about what comes to your mind. And then we'll take already a few questions so that our panelists can keep them in mind when they go through their uh, short uh, presentations. So we just have one minute left of our introductory phase of this session. Just exchange with the person next to you. What are your questions when you think about using data to actually exploit the skills potential and make policy decisions. Okay. Allora. <laughs> okay. I'm, are you ready with your questions? I think there are many. Okay, thank you. Very good. This is a good way of uh, eliciting questions and also uh, waking up people. Eh? Good one. Um, two questions. One, um, particularly on data. Um, you know, what skills are in demand in the labor market? The data question. And second question is also about what percentage of people are getting employed after the training? Thank you. Okay, I would like a question from the youngest person in the room. Who is the youngest person in the room? <laughs> In the back seats, I see. Okay, without pitching on who is the youngest. Any question? Anyone under 25? I think we don't have. Anyone under 30? <laughs> I'm 23. <laughs> 
So I'm actually really happy to see you on this board as a mother of four children and working for UNESCO for 25 years. And yeah, we also have the same problem. Um, I'm from World Skills, and we see that at every competition that it's such a male-dominated sector. And I would really be interested in the approach that you have to make changes in that. And now the most senior person in the room. <laughs> okay. I am almost. But not the <laughs> it's fine. Go ahead with your question. Okay. <laughs> But, well, it's just we're talking about, I think, in order to use data, one of the things that probably should happen is to change the teacher's mindset, okay? Because we see that young people are very fast. They, they know how to use it. So if the, if the teachers are, are not, doesn't work with the same speed of the student, this is not going to work. It's, it's not a question. So the question could be, is there a role for the providers and the teachers in mobilizing the use of data and how you get them there? Exactly. That very was good. the question. Thank you very much. I just want to mention, in addition, that we have to take care of reliability of data. And avoid fake news. <laughs> OK. If you have other questions, keep them for later. We will get back to that. And uh, did you take note of the questions? Yes. So we go ahead and uh, I ask uh, Helen to start and guide us through the work uh, that UNESCO has done. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. I think the this is not complete, but we, we have a, uh, the slide is, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you for the, the, the different questions, and uh, I will try to, uh, to address uh, them, although uh, what, just, uh, what uh, Olivier mentioned about the reliability of data is one of the challenges that uh, we have uh, faced uh, in the Mediterranean region. So, um, there are different methods uh, to anticipate uh, the future skills needs and uh, what we have uh, tried in the Mediterranean region is to adapt the current uh, approach that is led by uh, the CDFOP for the European countries which are, have a very sophisticated um, statistical infrastructures. So in the, in the South Mediterranean area, as you can imagine, uh, the, I mean, we don't have the same uh, availability of data, the same access of data, the same historic uh, data and long time series are not with the same, um, the same timeliness and uh, availability. So the, uh, the scheme that you see uh, as an overview of the approach that we have adopted in the, in the countries uh, is a simplified model trying to uh, measure the imbalances on the labor market uh, with uh, the demand on one side, the projected demand by occupations, with the projected supply of uh, the labor force uh, on the, on the right-hand uh, side. Uh, and then when you make the difference, you, see, you can see where, where are the occupations and the sectors where there are uh, surpluses or shortages. Uh, I will not go, of course, into the, the detailed uh, results uh, in, this, uh, in this session, <laughs> but uh, what we can see, it's, uh, it's a simplified quantitative uh, method uh, that, that was adapted, and, but that needs to be complemented with qualitative uh, methods. Uh, the, the projection, the, the skills projections, what we call uh, our occupations, are not a result to be taken uh, uh, per se, uh, and this is not like a crystal ball that needs to be, uh, to be uh, immediately translated into policy actions. Uh, so this is very important to, to bear in mind that uh, skills forecasting, as you can see through this approach, that was uh, implemented with national institutions in uh, seven countries of the Medi Mediterranean area. This approach was an initial process that was led in the past uh, four years with one institution per country, 
which is only one tool that, that is uh, now available in the, within the countries, but which needs to be complemented with more qualitative uh, methods. In Lebanon, for example, it was very difficult uh, to, to, to build a quantitative, uh, such quantitative model, so a more qualitative approach was led with uh, in-depth sectoral analysis in five sectors. So this gives um, uh, key trends uh, about the future uh, labor market uh, trends and the future imbalances, but not really uh, detailed results. Also, for example, the disaggregation of uh, the, the results is, is, uh, is also an issue and needs to be tackled by uh, successive uh, skills uh, projections uh, exercise, exercises. Uh, so what is important to remember uh, besides the fact that uh, the, 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 we, we have preliminary results with uh, occupations in demand, for example, in the region. It's only one key information uh, that needs to be uh, owned by the different institutions that, and, and for example, uh, social partners, uh, so the, the private sector representatives, which were not totally uh, involved in this exercise uh, for uh, different reasons, uh, needs really to be involved in this exercise. And we have uh, established uh, national uh, stakeholder platforms that uh, in theory should involve, uh, together with national institutions, uh, the, uh, the social partners, but also youth organizations. So the capacities of all all those category, uh, categories of stakeholders uh, need uh, needs, uh, to, be, to be built. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is what I can say uh, for now on this. <laughs> can you just tell us briefly yeah. what sectors did you focus on and what top professions came up as in demand for the region? The, the, main, trends, uh, the main trends in the region are uh, not uh, likely to, to change, meaning that, as you may know, in the, in the, in the Arab region, uh, the, the high youth uh, unemployment rates concern uh, qualified and, uh, I mean, uh, graduate uh, students. Uh, so the, 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 demand, uh, the demand trends that are, uh, that are emerging from the results uh, show that uh, there won't be any change. The, the, the time horizon was uh, four to five years, according to the countries. They have tried to uh, align with their national uh, strategic plans, and uh, we don't see a major, change, major changes in, uh, in terms of... Uh, um, demand for low qualified um, uh, workers compared to the high qualified workers. Thank you. So we go ahead and now we hear about uh, the new disruption that is introduced. This yes. Uh, so I just want to ex start by saying that I agree with uh, Helen. No? I used before uh, going to Hamburg to the Institute of Lifelong Learning to work as a women's education specialist. I was uh, teaching sociology at the University of the Philippines in my country. And I, all, I was teaching research methods. And we always say perspectives are very important in guiding research. We always, I always tell my students there are three perspectives. Of course, at the time, that those were the main paradigms, positivism, critical thinking, and all these things. And I think that's very important. The discourse on gender Tibet has shifted. In the 80s, you talked about female participation in male-dominated Tibet. More recently, you talk about access, and that's what we have, access. No? And I think because these are the paradigms, we focus on access. And in this uh, 9 million euro project that we are now implementing in Malawi, funded by the EU, one key access is gender equality. 
and the main indicator is access. But what does access mean? So to give you an idea, and we have several reports that have come out of this project, and this is one of them. We had did a career and guidance counseling um, study to show that, in fact, career and guidance counseling for girls and women are so poor, so how can you lead them to um, Tibet. But here is a video which I'll show you a video which won, in fact, the EU DEVCO Communication Award for 2018. We did this last year, and the EU colleagues themselves voted this as their most desired video. So let me show you just one minute and a half, and then you can see what perspective we are trying to address. Thank you, Max. Iye dinji wanka sisimu kunama koma zodi nchito isanga kuire chifwanja chimuna ndikuletsa wawa monga bololo osamva matobe akwera nao matobe nkuruka osapakika ngati nanka fumbwe okhala sabata atunthu asana aje pachimanga ai kakuchitsakano imene imwansanga akwira yone kachimuna inchito mopanda phuma ife omudziwa ndikudziwa ndi olimba ntima ndi ode khameneyo Nchifukwa chake po munyadira kuti nyadu ndimamucha maingwazi ngwazi yachikazi Ati ndine wangazi silinga gwira nchito zina ai Poti ndine wangazi ine panga ndi panyumba basi nitokala chili chose ninga funelelo Nditogwira nchito yomwe ninga funelelo I am a soldier, plumber, even a pilot too. Even a mechanic, even a carpenter too. Do you know? We have politicians, electricians. They say one does in my too. Oh, oh. Good. Just to continue. So the, que the point was to give women access, but the challenge is we know that Tibet is a male-dominated sector, so what we did was we conducted a study, which is also available in the STEP website, on the reproductive and gender-based violence in Tibet. And I'm very proud to say that I think this is the very first study that is, has been done on really understanding gender-based violence because, of course, uh, Tibet is predominantly male. So you don't need to think about gender-based violence until women now start to enter and then you realize there are a lot of gender issues. So in terms of methodology, we used, of course, a questionnaire. Three Tibet colleges were surveyed. We used a questionnaire and then because we know that quantitative data gender-based violence is not quantifiable. So we had to have focus group discussions, separate discussions with girls and boys, and then we also had key informant interviews. And the main, of course, as you would expect, the main results are there's a lot of gender-based violence in the TVET colleges, whether from their cause male students who are harassing them that why are you here you're not this is not your place second from the teachers themselves mostly male of course and then of course third when they do work based learning and they're in the enterprises which is also male dominated and the challenge is you say now you want to give access to these women but what kind of environment is there? So you are making, you are making women, it's like a trap. I was discussing with our gender Tibet expert. I said, so it's a trap. We're letting them go to a place where they're so vulnerable. So given this, the data disrupts your idea of what we should do because we were thinking, okay, let's bring them, give them, we have 600 scholarships for, this girl, for these girls and women. We wanted to sensitize the, teacher, the male teachers, and of course, we wanted to look at the curriculum. And so on the basis of this, we had to shift our, and that's why it's disrupting given the kind of data that you generate because of a certain perspective. We realized that this path of making women participate, 
making them, giving them access has to be treated at different layers. And of course, I'd like to end this. Of course, the question is the rape is not uh, relevant for the young girls and women in a society where early child marriages are uh, dominant. So you cannot ask them if they rape are rape because they might not even know what that means where they are grown, they are growing in a society where say, okay, you know, you're a child, you're 10 years old, I, you can now marry this man. So I think it's important when we look at data and of course we very well know that the SDGs is introducing big data. And as I said, I agree with Helen that we need to be able to understand what is big data for and what data we need so badly, but which is not sexy because who wants to talk about gender-based violence? Of course, today in the news, Harry Weinstein is going to be in the police, but in fact, it's very prevalent and we don't want to talk about it in a situation where it's male-dominated. Thank you. So we are learning that uh, dealing with disruptions requires also managing complexity and managing a different set of evidence and data that comes from the quantitative and from modeling, but also from research and social sciences. Um, and we have another element coming in that uh, Davor will introduce us to, which are uh, real-time data. What is this about? Exactly. Uh, and, you know, look at the title here of the, this forum, Managing Skills in Time of Disruption, uh, you know, how we could tackle this. I mean, for sure, what will help greatly is uh, information, it's the data. And on top of that, if possible, in real time. Um, so I'll try to kind of explain you. I won't go too technical about it, what we do uh, briefly and then certain concepts. And uh, I immediately want to say, and what we already experienced, um, we see this da data set as something which uh, fully complements the existing data you've been working with or government is supplying. And actually in combination, and there is a couple of reports and uh, research papers um, and outcomes, shows that once combined, actually the benefit in terms of um, what we could uh, conclude or how we could shape our decisions, it's the, uh, it's the biggest. So, what are we doing here? Just, you know, some people know, uh, maybe majority don't. Basically, we look at the job vacancies, job ads. You collect them in uh, uh, um, large numbers. Um, and basically, uh, uh, you only go to the public sources, you know, they're scraping technologies, and you do that every day. And more or less, the process is that uh, once you have a job text, you segment it, you know, there is certain uh, techniques in terms of parsing, you code it then, so there is a combination of rule-based and AI-based engine which can read that text and transform it into around 60 to 70 standardized, normalized data elements. A little bit technical, but not too much. And uh, the most important element there, and what is something new we bring to the, um, you know, if you want to TVET space, is uh, the skills. Uh, and when I say skills, I mean really, really granular. So think about uh, our taxonomy of 17,000 skills, 65,000 variances, several levels. And once you go through these millions of job postings and aggregate that, yeah, the pictures become uh, much, much clearer. Um, just to complete the process, uh, uh, once you code it, you deduplicate and uh, more or less in 48 hours, the data is available for the analysis. Now, what it brings new to the, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and, and to this whole, you know, situation. Uh, first, we avoid the time lag, so we're talking not year two, three, we're talking uh, two days. Um, on another side, when you think about it, uh, uh, um, it covers the whole market. <coughs> Uh, uh, and it's also totally demand driven. So it basically, because you know, you're deriving the data from the job vacancies, you're learning about what employers need in this moment of the time. Uh, when you do service and stuff, it's kind of a combination of what is existing or coming from before and what is potentially new. Um, 
On another side, it also allows you then to segment the data according, so you can look at the skills from occupational perspective, you can take the angle from the industry, you can combine it with geography, and very importantly, you can da go down all the way to the firm level. I'll give you a very quick example, uh, learning from the recent uh, research um, about concentration of the labor market. Uh, they've done it on U.S. data, and basically the conclusion is, if you use the same metrics the governments would use for uh, uh, allowing or not allowing certain uh, uh, um, acquisitions because of too much concentration and basically elimination of competition, the, 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 the data showed uh, in that research 54% of labor market in the United States is highly concentrated. Um, the immediate conclusion out of that could be in one part the answers why we don't see wages really moving. Uh, so I'm just leaving you with that thought. We're not going to discuss this. There is a whole paper. It's available online. We have like a research pages. But what I'm trying to say, it started to really uncover a lot of, um, how to say, um, uh, uh, you know, this uh, learning about what's going on in the labor market. In terms of, uh, I will try to address some of the skills. Someone asked what, what skills are growing and etc. Obviously, uh, the most uh, acceleration we have in anything connected with the digital, and then on top of that with the data. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, 1,600 percent year on year, you know, from maybe a couple hundred jobs to a couple thousand. Um, we're seeing that also in cybersecurity. What we're also seeing is these digital skills going across horizontally. So it's almost very hard to find a job which um, uh, uh, would not require at least, you know, one or two minimum, you know, digital knowledge or skill or competency. Um, now I know some questions might come a lot about lower end of the market. And, you know, just quickly to say at the moment we are doing this for six countries, uh, UK, Canada, USA, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. There will be ten more coming um, in the uh, EU uh, uh, region uh, from next year. And uh, we are thinking and actually uh, in discussion and hopefully we'll be able to deliver something in a low and middle income uh, area as well. Uh, what people are, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, a little it's okay, yeah. yeah no we problem. can move ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's basically, uh, 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 you know, what you have with this information. Uh, and here are some examples, for example. These are the examples when you look on a very granular level how you can help people um, transitioning. And basically what I would like to say is fundamentally, I mean, fundamentally it comes down to uh, how we can deliver effectively the map of the labor market to different stakeholders. On one side we have educational institutions, on the other side we have policy and government, we also have employers, and uh, last but not at least we do have uh, obviously job seekers and students. So delivering of that map and basically closing the information gap will probably help a lot with the reduction of the skills gaps too. Because some analysis and work shows that skills gaps at the moment are highly influenced by basically people, in a way, if you want, making irrational decisions about their educational choices, and then we end up in a mismatch situation, and obviously uh, players in the market are not happy. Uh, maybe for people, uh, maybe for you just to kind of uncover another thing, uh, looking at these um, job vacancies, um, it's quite interesting to see almost equal amount of functional and soft skills that basically tell you that uh, soft is uh, uh, as important or employability skills as the hard skills. Um, another thing I think what is conceptually interesting with this type of data is that we have employers unconsciously actually, actually telling us what really matters for the particular role, for the particular title, in a way for the particular occupation. Because when they're writing that advertisement, they're translating the job, post, job description to the job posting. And 
you know, implicitly doing that, basically almost like if you want ranking. So for this role in this moment in time, I really will pay attention on these five, six, usually we see functional skills and five, six soft skills. So that's, um, you know, in short, uh, uh, um, about uh, real-time labor market data. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, one of the big dilemmas with uh, evidence and data and research and publications is that very often we hear policymakers saying, okay, yes, it's done, and we just put it there. So my question to you is, uh, uh, it's great, great work. Uh, what do you do out of it? What's the action or what are the conditions that make it possible to use this data to generate some actions? Caroline. Yes, just let me uh, briefly respond to uh, David. If I use my gender lens, I could easily say that is there a different uh, salary for a female journalist and a male journalist? Is there a different salary for a female cybersecurity analysis or a male? Anyway, as you, if you notice since yesterday, you can see the German women were very much in Tibet. And I wanted to respond to the uh, youngest woman. And that's the point. You need an environment where gender equality can flourish. And as you can see, the women who came here, came up, except of course from the Philippines, most of them were from countries which had very strong gender equality perspectives. And I think the challenge we face is data. What, who determines reliability of data? Is big data, quantitative data always uh, reliable? We know now how news can be manipulated. And as a researcher, teacher, I always said we need to be careful on how we gather data, how we process data, and how we analyze data. And so for me, what has been the most important learning in the one year that we have had in terms of after getting these statistics is to try to see how do we have this new perspective on our program. And let me show you now the shift from the first video where we say, women, you need to go to the TVET. Here is now the second video which we have produced to address this. Thank you, Max. Daima Manja Mobandagan from Nimba Mapuru, Suguru, Yobere, Wera, Kumabe, Kungondo, Yolimban and Inkaza, Zoshi, Dirama, and Asunguana Daima. Oh, the Gwetsa Ule, Singambiri, Zokumudwita, Osaripera, Ifebe, Osa, Fogang, Ganga, Gumenyan, and Inkaza, Zidaima. Demu madifunsa, mene muna ambila muja Nkaza zabama isisi kuta bwanji osango tulazida Siti kuene la kule maboshita sabwino Ndima ukashuluga nje kutikukuja Pompano pompano tikonje tsangkaza zinganga anga kumkondo itaima Ndana anazo sayamba Mamete edu ama kono bling bling iba kosi madabu nkati Ajinya mada ozitada Sa pyo pyo nagabe na ugira gira atika Na sa kufuna mabai kwa mpazali Limozi na ogu nkondo itaima Male ginyanya atwa ziti rogo nzedu wa moga da ulo Kamuetu liro kashabu Umango ziwira atu tuwa sungwa na ozitada Siti kache tebo jiti tuwa nkaza Ndifenso ku nkondo itaima Ndeti mafusidwa, wajinya mada denge gaola njiba nkondo yoli mba nandi nkaza zoshi tirama. Thank you, Max. So, in fact, what we have tried to do, because we know that environment is very important, as you can see, these are subtitled. This is, uh, Robert is one of the, the most famous, uh, he's an award-winning poet in Malawi, and we use their forms poetry and uh, Sanji is one of the most famous singers in Malawi to make sure that we send this message and I think one important uh, message that we are trying to do it's not only empowering women but men to address their masculinity and in terms of the teachers who are mostly male of course the challenge is how you address your power relations in a formerly only male sector so what happens when you bring in women how do you 
not only empower the women, but how do you make men realize the vulnerabilities? And I think that's what we have done in the last for one year, that we have implemented this. Thank you. Davor, how do we use... Yeah, look, uh, f firstly, you can do historical analysis, uh, you know, in, in, in our case, data goes back to 2010-12, depend on the country, so you can see the trending. Uh, second, actually, interesting gender example, i just give one data example, for example, you have web, develop, web developers, it's, uh, in, this is United States data, 47% of women are in that uh, occupation, if you want, or that job. But then, if you move to the mobile developers, it's only 7%. And now, for example, by analysis of the skills and stuff, you know, you can actually see that the difference between those two jobs is not that big. And maybe it's just one or two things which need to be learned or, and not, not necessarily always ask for education, maybe you just need to kind of, as a person, focus on it. And this is again, back to my point, ability to uh, deliver that map is essential. You know, people, if people know what is required, um, and if they're motivated, hopefully they will do it. Another thing I would like to say, there is ability with our data in combination with uh, government-provided projections on the growth and, uh, uh, um, you know, demographics to do predictions in terms of how the occupations and, 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 and jobs, if you want, and, and career paths might be developing in the future. And... Um, recent World Economic Forum and Boston Consulting Group uh, report on towards reskilling revolution, very easy to find just by Googling World Economic Forum, BCG, uh, and, and uh, reskilling. Uh, it will bring that report up, shows actually, uh, um, purely using these data methods uh, um, and understanding how similar the skills are, uh, uh, how we might see uh, 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 world of work shaping in terms of the trajectories. This is important uh, uh, because of this thinking around automatization. You know, we have sectors of the uh, economy which will be affected by automatization. You know, what then these people will do? So just a very quick example on that. You know, that basic report would say if you do nothing, uh, let's say this group of people might have uh, one, two, three choices with existing skill set. And for example, data is showing approximately an average $8,000 decrease in salary. However, just by intervention of, with a couple of skills, the number of choices goes between 14 and 17. By going further, maybe, you know, introducing um, qualification, certification, doing more on the educational side, uh, I remember from the report, the number of options grows to 28. And uh, an average approximately 15,300, I think, to be exact, increase in salary. So this type of uh, uh, evidence and learning and uh, understanding exactly how the labor market operates, for sure, will help us all and help you in decision making. Helen. Tell us, what's next on the use of this evidence and what can make uh, action happen out of it? I think that uh, the intervention of Devor and also uh, of Caroline show that uh, the, the, the complementarity of uh, the, the different uh, um, results that we can use to get a full picture because there is no um, sole method that can uh, be used and that can provide an accurate picture. And uh, uh, we have also in, to take into consideration the pace of the countries themselves. Uh, as an international organization, it's very difficult uh, to, uh, to come and to impose some, uh, some priorities, although, uh, of course, the gender equality is, in a, is, is, is part of UNESCO strategy. But what I mean is that uh, we have to align also with the priority. And if it's not, for example, possible to uh, forecast uh, the future demand uh, uh, for women, women's jobs, for example, it's possible to get by other means 
uh, by uh, so sociological studies, uh, but also with uh, scenario development in involving uh, the different uh, representatives. Uh, in terms of inclusiveness, it also uh, means that uh, the young people, for example, the youth representative, and I'm coming back to the Arab region, uh, we know that in the previous uh, years this was so important that it's not possible, it's no longer possible to, uh, to, 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 to engage a national dialogue only with uh, the ministries. It's very important in terms, of course, uh, as you know, uh, in governance of TVET to have uh, different stakeholders uh, around the table. Um, in terms also of uh, sustainability, because um, the, the countries, of course, uh, can rely on uh, very innovative uh, technologies, but also we have to um, encourage uh, this, uh, those uh, initiatives and those uh, new capacities of the countries within institutions and not within uh, individuals or experts, as you mentioned yes, um, previously. You talked about uh, the expertise uh, that is uh, mobili mobilized, uh, but also the partnership. And it's very, very important to have um, partnerships at, uh, at national level uh, and in, a, in an incremental process that, uh, that gives autonomy to the country in deciding, uh, in, in masterizing different tools and also in deciding which are the most useful uh, tools in order to have a, a full uh, labor market information and intelligence system that can address their needs. Uh, the, the different stakeholders cannot uh, be interested in something they, they don't find useful. So it's very important for the sustainability of uh, different actions and also for sharing good practices uh, at national, at regional uh, level to, to, to develop the capacities of the institutions and the partnerships at national level, so uh, they can, uh, I mean, each uh, stakeholder can contribute to uh, the identification and the anticipation of uh, future skills needs. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, before opening up to questions, I have another question for you, um, and I will open up in a second which is actually to think really uh, what kind of data do you have available for your decisions in any position that you uh, occupy and what in your responsibility. And if you don't have that evidence available, how can you get it? Uh, but if you have it, how do you use it and how do you engage in uh, a cooperation with other actors to act on it. So I think this is an important question for, for all of us that we need to carry with us and hopefully give an answer to so that we can move forward with uh, using uh, the evidence uh, and uh, the different methods uh, available. Questions to you. I was just thinking uh, two questions. First to Davor. Um, uh, I'm part of the uh, ESCO uh, project that is uh, happening in Europe. And uh, as you were talking, uh, several issues came up. First, uh, you said live labor market um, follow-up. This is something that uh, is absolutely disputed with the social partners in, uh, uh, when we come to decision making on, on a policy level. Uh, we have uh, a, an ongoing strong argument about defining um, qualifications, which TVET qualifications, according to labor market needs. Why is that? Because uh, it is the unions it's even the, also the employers' associations who really say you will reduce your labor market uh, flexibility if you just adjust your qualifications according to the current needs. Of course, for employers, it's important to have the person that fits right on their needs. But as a public stakeholder, 
as a ministry we are, we are not interested to qualify people just according to today's market's needs. They may change tomorrow. Uh, you need some transversal skills. You need skills that are not directly uh, uh, relevant for the labor market. So I just wanted to throw a red flag on some of the arguments that not everything will be better by having the current uh, labor market happenings displayed. Um, and of course, it may be interesting for you to know that ESCO is a, a project that is promoted by the European Union and it has a, a very controversial state on just this part, just the part that you, that you mentioned. Um, second qu question to Helen. So what is the skills potential and the skills needs for the Mediterranean area? I'm asking that because I'm so hungry to know what it is and you haven't, maybe I didn't hear it, but what is happening in the Mediterranean? What I know is that we have had years of uh, academic qualifications that went into nowhere. You have thousands and thousands of academics in the northern uh, African countries that are, have been studying into unemployment. What does that mean for a TVET? One yeah, comment, one I think question. there are another two questions. We take them and then I give you one minute each to close. So, uh, it's not, uh, it's a contribution. I wanted to, the, the last presentation, I wanted to emphasize and mention that I think that in the upcoming 10 years, in order to know the need of skills or soft skills, we will be able to know it really automatically at the second. Because with the big data, with multidimensional analysis that you have done in your study, we have a lot of platforms now, even in Africa, where you have job posting with what they are, they are looking for. And with all this data, with the techniques that we use, we will be able to know what currently for a job your people, um, labor market are looking for. So for me, I think that this is some, a, a potential that we have to val value in many countries. This is for the current, what my labor market is needed, needed now. But we have to combine with the work that uh, uh, Ellen has done, because as he said, we can know what the labor market is needing, is looking now, but for the future sometime, the technique, the analysis, multidimensional analysis technique is not real, uh, is are not adequate for the, so for the future. So for, for me, I think that the two presentations is really uh, good if you want to know the current and the future of the labor market. Okay. Jovan. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to bring here my experience uh, uh, that has, uh, has been done uh, within the Skillman uh, project, uh, the Sector Skill Alliance on Advanced Manufacturing. Man means not man <laughs> for manufacturing. Uh, I was in a meeting where a trade union leader was attacking us, why men and not women? Okay, well, that's not the case. Okay, in our experience, uh, uh, we reflected on, on the uh, capacity we have to design new uh, curricula, new learning pathways uh, on the expecting uh, new jobs. And then we have seen that normally there is a, a, a lack of uh, response. There is a time that the system is able to implement the new curricula in the school because you have to identify, then you have to design the curricula, you have to uh, uh, implement the curricula, and then the job is changed. It's too late. So, and we asked to us, how could be the way to make this process more fast? To, to make it speed. So, and we asked to our industrial partners, how do you um, expect, how do you uh, design the way that the factory, your factory will be tomorrow? And they said, okay, we have a research de department. Okay, we want to go to the research department and ask what are the technology that they have now in the, factor, in the uh, research department that will be in the production line tomorrow. Okay, there is another way that you uh, implement uh, 
to uh, discover the new technologies that, yes, we make a scouting. What does it mean? We go or, or everywhere is possible to see the startup, the innovation, the ideas, and we look for we are uh, that, that for something that we think that is interesting for us. Okay, we want to go there. So we have applied the, the ILO um, uh, Skolkovo method on skill for sight, but we have done a small adaptation to this, uh, uh, taking in consideration that uh, the, the European Commission invests in innovation, tunneling the, the ideas in a, uh, in a supporting process and arriving at the startup after a certain period. And we said, okay, we want to go in the reverse of this process and we want to get the information not only from the current situation and current companies and current needs. We want to know also what are the needs of the startup and what are the, the few expected needs of the ones that have just an idea of a new company or technology. Okay, so the question is, uh, with your fabulous technology that you have the ability to manage big data, could you be able, or maybe you are doing this, uh, could you be able to make uh, uh, analysis on, for example, another thing that we implement is on raw material, because the transformation of raw material will bring to new technologies and then, and then to new professions. So could you be able to analyze this kind of data in addition to the current needs of the, of the employers? This is the last question from Boren. It's really the last, 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 because we are late and uh, I have the Master of Ceremony here standing. <laughs> Uh, I will be very short, and it's not, uh, it's not a question, it's, it's uh, to, to go into this direction, and I'm not sure that the work can respond to that question, <laughs> speaking on behalf of the work. But I think when we are looking at, for example, how the green economy, and looking at how the new jobs, we were speaking with different specialists, and those people were telling us, look, we cannot tell you what jobs. The technology is changing, material are changing, and the question is to look at what methodology we can do to anticipate and the link between research, technology, and job creation. And I think that the forecasting models we have do not allow that. And the real-time data definitely uh, cannot. But there are other tools and uh, there are other methods that are used to help connect research or, sci or uh, innovation and research and technology and, and jobs. Okay, from our panelists. 30 seconds each, half of the time. Speak fast. No, I actually fully agree uh, down there, uh, what did you say? Uh, for sure, don't just look that, don't just be myopic. But this is kind of, you know, we have a mosaic problem here. This is one, another missing puzzle. We didn't have nothing. Uh, real time from the industry and think about this like let's say I'll use UK example you're talking 10 million unique jobs over years so it's a huge sample that's good about it in terms of the reliability there's not bias and also let's not forget it goes quite deep into the middle size companies and usually with surveys you get bias towards the larger companies so uh, and then for example just put some ideas into people's mind. One thing other you can do, adaptation of technology. This is the only data source now to tell you, let's use the example of, I don't know, blockchain. Does anyone know, is it, is it used in Germany? Who is using it? Which company? If you know the profile of the person who is a blockchain specialist, you scan the market with those couple of skills, it will actually tell you. Another thing, for example, in terms of historical stuff is, if we spot and agree that this is a new skill today, we can go back into the data and study where it started, how it started, and how it spread. And I think from that we can learn a lot then about what is coming and how it will continue spreading in the future so that when we make decisions that we have more certainty about it. In terms of these courses in two, three years, I was saying, my only answer will be, uh, look, I'm not a specialist in this, but uh, education institutions will need to innovate too and make that uh, cycle much shorter. There is no other answer. Helen. Just to respond quickly to, to Oliver, uh, I mean, we, we don't have, we have to, 
not uh, not to under underestimate uh, the uh, the data privacy and the the challenges in accessing data uh, for for in in the countries we are in the developing uh, countries uh, it's not obvious at all that they will let you access their data they will let experts come in to work with them with them uh, even though uh, i mean you we, we, we mobilize uh, expertise. So what I mean is that even among different departments in some countries, the, the departments of the same ministry, they don't want to share the data. They don't want, in, <laughs> a fortiori, to share the results. So the results, we, we have preliminary exercise, uh, preliminary results of the skills forecasting, uh, but it's not possible to release uh, per se. It's a national um, uh, initiative to, uh, to share the results. Uh, at the time, they, they will feel that it's shareable. So it's very difficult to comment uh, uh, here, especially, uh, and I, I mean, in terms of uh, reliable results, it took decades for the most sophisticated uh, systems, uh, as in the UK or the, the USA or uh, in um, Netherlands, for example, where there are very performant uh, skills forecasts. You know, so it's very uh, important to, to bear in mind that the achievement within this project, which is being continued, is more in the journey, in the process that was started, uh, at national level within stakeholders in data uh, provision, data sharing among the different uh, stakeholders uh, with uh, the, uh, the institution in charge of uh, modeling, for example. Uh, and we, we don't have to, uh, to underestimate those kind of challenges. We will publish uh, soon um, uh, a synthesis report on this initiative. So we, you will have more details about the challenges and the, the approach that was led. Thank you. So wait for the publication. That was an ad. <laughs> Caroline. Okay. Uh, I think as we have, uh, you have seen, uh, data is, a very imp is very important in shaping our response to change. But in the, on the other hand, uh, the question that we need, the questions that we pose, the research agenda that we have, we need to ask who's driving this and to what extent can it really transform TVET. Thank you. So I thank you as well. I thank you all of you. Uh, I think now we can uh, stand up again, right? And go for coffee. <laughs> and uh, thank you everyone <laughs> for the session.